Hello friends and welcome to Monday's Kings of Anglia podcast, a historic show. Yes, Ipswich Town is still fair to mediocre. Yes, they're still not that good. But friends, there is good news on the horizon. Easter is just around the corner. Spring is in the process of springing or sprunging or however you want to pronounce it. The sun is out. I had crumpets and cheese for breakfast. And it's also KOA 200 today. Don't look too closely at the numbering. But we're saying it's KOA 200, a historic show, the titans of Ipswich Town podcasting that are my three friends and yours truly, Mark Heath. I'm your host and it couldn't be the show it is without the three titans of town news, opinion and views that I'm about to introduce. First of all, I'm going to start with the two guys who started this podcast four years ago, Andy Hutch Warren. Happy Monday to you. Sir, I don't think that titans of anything sit underneath this rabbit blanket that I've been telling you about on a few occasions that I have on my lap all day, every day while I'm working. It, I don't feel like a titan of any of anything, quite quite frankly. But what, what um, you but, what you t- what you teaming that with? So you've got the, the rabbit blanket. Have you got some some old man slippers on as well, or? No, bare bare feet, just a pair of just a pair of shorts under there. But it's nice and cozy. It's just it's, I'm, I'm more of a I'm more cozy than than kind of Titanic. If that's <laughs> uh, that's just just my approach to to life in general. There you go. Um, I'll take it. Okay, so from a man under a rabbit blanket to a man who doesn't have a rabbit. An excellent segue. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Watson. <laughs> Hi. Uh, no, you? I don't have a rabbit. Do you have any pets? No. This is, this is gold. This, this is, is absolute, absolute gold. Absolute podcast gold. This is why we're such a massive deal. 200 shows and counting. Um, and also the junior member of the group. But if comments are to be believed around KOA 200, Ross, by far the runaway star of the show, mm. the man who's not trimmed his beard since 1874... Roscoe, the prospect. How are you? I'm very well. The sun is shining. I have recently discovered a new Jaffa cake bar called a Zingy Orange Cake Bar. So I'm buzzing for that. I'll probably eat that during the show when one of you guys is speaking. I will be listening, but I'll be eating some Zingy goodness from Jaffa Cakes. It can't be long, surely, before you get officially sponsored by the, the Jaffa Cakes. Yeah, my, my agent's sorted out for me. So, you know, Liam, yeah. Liam from Crew is sorting it out. So, you know. I'd love to see. I'd love to see Ross with some outstanding product placement, a little Jaffa Cakes cap and T-shirt, something like that. Um, make sure you mute yourself, Ross, when you start munching on that, just for later on. Um, um, boys, we're going to get onto KOA 200 in a minute, but obviously um, we are an Ipswich Town podcast. And before we get all self-indulgent and congratulatory, um, let's talk about Ipswich Town because they played again at the weekend at Portsmouth, um, and again they lost. Uh, it wasn't as bad as the absolute horror show at Fleetwood. Um, they played well for 40 minutes uh, and then it all went tits up again. Um, so they played well for 20 minutes against Plymouth. Then they were absolutely dreadful against Fleetwood. Then we get 40 minutes out of them against Portsmouth. So the next game, Wigan, they're going to be dreadful. And then maybe we might get 80 minutes perhaps for the game after that. Um, Stewie, Portsmouth, your thoughts on the game? <clears throat> really frustrating, wasn't it? Because as you've just said there, for 40 minutes, they... They were really good. It was the it was the Plymouth start again, but but for longer. High energy, high press, off the ball, on the ball. There was there was zip and intent about them. They were deservedly in the lead. Really good finish from from James Norwood. Um, and the game was there. Um, the game was there for them, as Paul Cook said, in the palm of their hands. But I don't know what it is about this team, but they're just. You just always fear that something's going to go wrong, and and it did go wrong. It was it was a it was a corner just before half time. Good delivery, good header. You could argue that you've got to defend it a bit a bit stronger, but it goes in, and sometimes that happens, and then and then you have to. Then it's all about character, and um, the character wasn't there. They just seemed to the body language. Just they, the players seemed to shrink a little bit. They seemed to go into their shells, and the second half was a bit nothingy but they still somehow contrived to, to lose the game. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of brought this debate about the, the character, the 
the mental strength of the players that Paul Cook himself has kind of brought to the forefront uh, with his post-match comments, um, all the more into focus heading into the running. Yeah, I mean, it's something we've talked about a lot on here. Um, in fact, we were talking about it only last week, Hutchie, about how fragile and brittle the players seem to be. Um, and it was another example, I guess, on Saturday. It's just, they, they just, it's minor setbacks, like conceding a goal, which, which happens in football matches. It happens to every team that play football. But the reaction to it, 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 you feel like they're just being thrown off course so significantly by simply conceding a goal. Um, and it's not great, is it? It's not the first time we've seen it. They didn't get going again after that. It was, it was the, you talk about a goal just before half time being bad timing, don't you? You can't, and it probably was. Um, never got going again after that. And uh, like Stu said, they've ultimately ended up conceding a second one. But it's, it, it's conceding a goal shouldn't be as big a setback as it is to this team. Yeah, you, you want. You should be able to brush that off and just get going again. Okay, okay, we played well for forty minutes. We've conceded a goal. Let's get back on it again. Mm. Um, but they're they're not able they're not able to do it, and certainly weren't on this occasion anyway. Mm. So we talk about positives before we get to the um, the meltdown. Roscoe, the first forty minutes were good. Your boy uh, Guion laid on the goal for Norwood. Judge had a tremendous free kick, well saved. Before that, Town were looking good, weren't they? What what did you um, find impressive about about Town before it all went wrong? It was better than Fleetwood. It was a better watch. Um, I actually really did enjoy the first the first half in general. Was you know Stu mentioned the second half was there was nothing to it, was it really? Um, but the first half I was really enjoying it. You know, high press from both sides. You know, chances being created, and you know, Town were on top, and they really deserved to be maybe going into halftime in the lead. But then they conceded that that late goal um, just before half time. But yeah, town looked good. Um, but yeah, just a minor setback as 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 Hutchie said. That just yeah, ruined it for town. But yeah, it was good to see Norwood scoring a very good goal. Um mm. my boy of course Guy on setting him up. Um yeah, Judge's free kick. I sometimes feel like Judge is gonna score all the free kicks he's gonna take when it's in a good position, maybe twenty five yards out. I think he's always gonna score those. Um Norwood even had a chance when he headed it, didn't he? I think it was a, a very <laughs> a long ball. I think it was Guion who did the cross and I don't know how Norwood got to the head and it actually still stayed in. It hit the bar. Um, and, you know, Keenan Bennett's had a chance as well. Um, it, it was, yeah, it was a just a much improvement on the, you know, on the Fleetwood game because that was a painful watch. Mm. Um, but at least we got in- entertained somewhat in the first half. I actually enjoyed watching town mm. um, for the first time in a while. So, yeah, big up Paul Cook and the boys for that first 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just for that, just for that forty minutes. Um, we we spoke last week as well, Roscoe, about your your boy Miles Kenlock, uh, whether or not he he should be dropped after his one of his poor displays against Fleetwood. Uh, he wasn't even in the side, boys. Was that um, an injury thing or just a? Don't think so. No, no. Um, no. He's he's had his good run of form. He's kind of come away from that a little bit. He, I thought he was really poor at Fleetwood the other night, and think. Um, I think Cook just fancied a, a proper look at a proper look at Stephen Ward. I'm not sure if if Kenlock it, it's not as dramatic. I don't necessarily think as being completely bombed from the 18. I just don't know if there's a need to carry a player that can play at left back and left back alone mm. on the be- on the bench necessarily. Although there was a moment where Ward went down where you did wonder whether actually that that might be needed, but. Um, I think I think whatever happened, I think we were pretty clear that Paul Cook was going to side a new left back at some point, and that's this has just made that even even clearer. There, there will be a new starting left back at the start of next season. I, I feel certain of that. Mm. Siri, what um, what do you think extra Paul Paul Cook would have learned about his side from from Saturday? He's obviously very much still very young in his in his managerial time at Town. Four points from his first fifteen, not a great return. Um, and already talking about his players being mentally weak. What do, what do you think uh, he would have learned on Saturday? I think he's he's arrived with a pretty good idea of the imbalance of the squad, both in terms of uh, shortage of leaders, shortage of uh, the type of fullbacks that he wants to play his sort of non-negotiable uh high press positive football I think he knows that there needs to be a bit more steel in midfield um, 
I think he's treading on eggshells with his comments post match. I think he's he knows that in the short term he needs to to work with these players, but it's pretty clear it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that this is a man who is um, knows very much that a, a big summer rebuild will, will need to happen in the summer, whether whether they go up or not. Um, so I'm sure that's all feeding into the the players' psyche at the moment. We Andy and I. Post match, we're down at the touchline. Spoke to Paul Cook. Andy spoke to to Teddy Bishop, and then the players started to kind of filter past us from the dressing room back to the team coach. And there were some some real ashen ashen faces walking along there. Um, players that looked like they'd been uh, told a few home truths in the dressing room. So I, I think what Mr. Cook is telling them privately is probably stronger than what what he's saying publicly at the moment. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's worrying, isn't it? Though I mean, there are all these players. A lot of them are out of contract. Um, they're at a point where they're surely playing to try and impress a new manager, and they still don't seem to be able to lift themselves, Hutchie. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a little bit worrying. Um, going through that team at at the weekend, like the entire back four are out of contract in the summer. Teddy Teddy Bishop, Alan Judge. Um, obviously, Keenan Bennett is going back, going back from loan. Gwian Edwards, is the, the vast majority of that team are all are all out of um, all out of contract in the summer. Maybe just thinking out loud, of some of the, is there an air of resignation about some of them? Maybe feeling that mm-hmm. they, they they're probably not going to get another contract. So what we what have we got to play for? It's I'm sure there are some that are thinking a little bit like that. But um, you, you'd hope for time, you'd yeah, hope for more. You should be playing for whatever your future is, even if you deep down know that you're not, you may be not getting the deal here at Ipswich. You start putting yourself in the shop window then for others as well. Make sure that you're, it's going to be a crowded old free market, uh, free agent market in the summer, as it was last year with with, with the COVID ramifications will, will rumble on, I'm sure. Um surely they, they know enough people that have sat as free agents for a large chunk of this season and not just walked into another club. You've got to be, um, you've got to be doing it for yourself mm. first and foremost, haven't you? Well, well Danny, Danny Rowe's a good example of that, isn't he? he obviously, obviously, I think he started pretty well with Burton, but he's had to wait six, seven months to to get a new job after after being mm. left. Um, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult, but you, the, the bottom line is... Of course, you'd 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 be expecting more from from them. The fire the fire just doesn't doesn't seem to be there. Mm. I, I well, wonder. Whether, we're talking about mental fragility. I wonder whether just pure fitness is an issue as well. We've talked about them fading after the twenty minutes against Plymouth. Forty minutes here. It's Paul Cook wants them running hard, and they did run hard in that first forty minutes. Let's not kind of overlook how good that first forty minutes was. I can fully get if that is a a taste of what is to come under Paul Cook, then I think we can all get on board with that. It's going to be exciting. But maybe these players just aren't fit enough, which is not good when we're this deep into the season that, you know, they're just not able to do that over over 90 minutes at the moment. Um, and maybe that is part of a legacy of whatever's gone on before. However, Paul Lambert set up his training sessions with... I don't know, Jim Henry ending up on gardening leave up in Scotland, you know, that we don't know the full picture there in terms of the training and the, the fitness set up and stuff like that. But perhaps that's an issue as well. I don't mm. know. It's, it was quite an old side as well, wasn't it? The back four, there's an average age of sort of nearly 33, 32, 33 in there. Alan Judge being asked to do an awful lot. I, I thought we, we were discussing it during the game, weren't we, Stu? He was kind of a nominal number 10, but being asked to do all of the tracking work of... Um, of Keenan Bennett, so he's playing as a number ten and doing all the defensive work as a, a left winger, and he and he's thirty two. He's a fit, he's a fit guy, but that's a lot. That's a lot to do. Maybe maybe you do run out of steam. James Nord is has been in and out of the side with injuries, hasn't he? And you're you're asking sort of to lead the the physical sort of the physical side of it, lead from the lead from the front. On that, he's thirty thirty one. So it's it's a as Ipswich Town teams go that we've seen of late. It's maybe one on the older end of um, of what we've seen over the over the last few years, which maybe does feed into the the fitness thing. I don't know. Do you think, boys? I wrote a piece before the season saying something along the lines of not only is this Ipswich Town side squad good enough to go up, it's potentially great. Do you think that me 
and us and maybe fans as a whole have grossly kind of overestimated how good this squad is because you look on paper and there's no doubt you know that a lot of the players you would think should be playing a level higher what, is it yeah. just not not as good no, as we think it is that, i think that's fair i think we are probably guilty we watched we've talked before about the we kind of lose sight of what, what is good sometimes because we, we live in the world of Ipswich Town. We watch them every week. So your bar is only set by what we see each week. So we get all excited about the first 40 minutes because it's set against the bar being so low from the Fleetwood game beforehand. And maybe we all, yeah, we get we get sort of sucked into the tunnel vision of what, what we see. And maybe we are all guilty of like Teddy Bishop. Isn't, isn't he a great player, the way he dribbles at mm. people? And Andre Dezel, a classy player that can play this range of passing. And we have got sort of sucked into this trap of, of over-hyping these players. And I think probably all of us on, on this call and have been guilty of that at times. I think the vast majority of town fans, even the, the staff at the club, have done that. And uh, But over a prolonged period of time, they're not producing. And I do just wonder... You know, we've talked about there being a few contract no-brainers that earlier everyone would have jumped at. You know, of course, you're going to keep Guion Edwards and of course, you're going to keep Teddy Bishop. I mean, that, that would have been unthinkable. But I, I'm starting to wonder now whether it's not impossible that Paul Cook might even semi-shock us with, with some of the players that, that he lets go, having come in and seen this with a fresh pair of eyes that, that none of us have maybe been looking at it with. I think that's very possible. Um, T- Teddy's a really interesting one. He he looked beaten when I spoke to him after the game, and I think there's a struggle there to find to find his role in this team. Um, Paul Cook wants certain things from certain positions on the pitch, and he's so he's so rigid with that, isn't he, Stu? That's what that's what he wants from from those positions. And if you can't if you can't give it to me, then I'll I'll, I'll find somebody find somebody that can. So I, I do I do think there's going to be some real real changes this summer and probably like you say Stu verging onto some of the ones that previously you might have thought were no were no brainers to keep we are going to craft a podcast around the out of contract players um, in due course maybe even later this week we'll see but I refuse to accept boys that on this pod- podcast we do hyperbole uh, we never go over the top uh, Ross let's talk about the positives um, Ipswich Town's greatest ever right back was back in action on Saturday, Kane Vincent Young. <laughs> um, how good is it to see KVY back? Oh, what a sight. Just what a beautiful sight. Just even just beforehand, when you saw him in the 18, you thought, it is damn true. He is here. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you guys at the game, I'm sure it was just great to see him out there warming up, um, you know, potentially him coming on. And, you know, I think, I think that was a good amount of minutes for him to come on. And he straight away, his first touch, he had a fantastic run and, you know, had an opportunity for us to score. Um, but it's just great. And, you know, a lot of fans, they love to see it as well. Um, number 24, certified baller, as they call him. Um, but I just, it was just great to see. It's just gr- good to see a right back flying down the wing. Um, you yeah. know, Luke Chambers, he, he's done well at right back this season. Um, but... He's 35 and he's not that quick. So it's just not, it's a nice change. And, you know, we need to be careful though. Don't want to, you know, <laughs> go too overboard about it because, you know, he's played one game, 10 minutes or so, but it's good to see him back. So a positive from the defeat. We know he's going to set up the winning goal at Wembley and come playoff final day. I've already predicted <laughs> that. Um, but KV, what I mean, it must have been so frustrating for a lad who's, who's so talented for his body to constantly let him down, boys. I mean, I can relate as a, as a similar level of athlete myself when I've had injuries. It's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating not being able to do what you love to do, especially when it's uh, how you make your living. But just, Stu, just talk a little bit about how important KVY could be to the side and what you think knock-on effect that will have on, on, on the back four with Chambers potentially moving side and who then goes out of Wilson and Nciala. Uh, to take the latter point, Chambers moved across to sort of left-sided centre half alongside Enciala, um, and James Wilson went off. Um, which I think, if you were talking about which of the two centre halves were more likely to keep their place in that scenario, I think nine out of ten people, if not more, would have said James Wilson, who's been Mister. We've talked about him being Mister. Reliable, Mister. Consistent, but I think maybe 
from what we're hearing, Paul Cook has kind of drilled into that and maybe sees things a, a little bit differently, sees maybe Toto as the more reliable of the two, which is pr- perhaps surprising. So I wouldn't be surprised from the noises we're, we're hearing that, that it will be the Chambers NCR the two if, as and when Kane Vincent Young can can play at right back, um, maybe with half an eye on next season with, you know, if, if you're going to retain Luke Chambers, which is a big if, you'd mm. be retaining him as a centre-half. Um, but to go back to, to Kane and the, the impact he could have, he is right in Paul Cook's wheelhouse. He is everything that Paul Cook wants from a, from a fullback, someone who virtually plays as a winger. Um, it's mad to think that prior to these injuries, Kane played nine games for Ipswich and managed to generate that level of excitement from nine matches. You know, he scored the goal. Was it Tranmere where he scored the goal, where he went up the right-hand side? And was that in the same game as the Garbutt free kick? I lose mm-hmm. track. He got the winner at Gillingham where he arrived at the far post. He's um, he, could, he could change that. It's it's no exaggeration to say he could change the whole dynamic of, of this side um, with, the, with the way he plays. But you just don't know how he's going to come back. He's, he's a player that I, I always fear that a player who is based on pace and acceleration after the type of injuries that he's had over a period of time um, that that can that some players don't come back quite the same but he is still only 25 and um, hope, hopefully he'll be he'll be good because he's, he's a lovely likable humble man with lots of other interests outside of football as well so I hope hopefully there weren't too many dark days for him during that period out but yeah great great to see him back Mm. Hutchie, I also feel it would be remiss of me not to give you an opportunity to comment on the kit from Saturday because you're very much a <laughs> kit man. I saw you tweeting about it. Some people took exception to the suggestion that, that the socks were yellow. That they are yellow. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, are we really taking exception to whether they are yellow or not? I saw or, people or... saying, no, 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 they're corn. It's not yellow. Town don't wear yellow. No, they're yellow and they look great. <laughs> they, they, um, I loved them when they got their first outing at... Um, at Wimbledon last February, they were with uh, maroon shorts that day, navy shorts on this occasion. Finished it off right nice, didn't it? Um, that's I, I like it. My my missus who, who listens to this podcast thought you got rather too carried away last week, Hutchie, when talking about Cole Skuse in the town kit. You were you sounded like you were getting yeah a little a little a little too enthusiastic. She thought just and thought he looked good, didn't it? <laughs> uh, no, I've got no, I. I, I I fear anything else I would say would just get me further into trouble. So yeah. uh, no, I'll. Uh, my my wife has never listened to this, by the way. No, not a, no. not a single single minute of it, and um, yeah. I imagine it's going to stay that way for all time. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that. It makes me feel a bit sad. You know, Vicky listening to her husband dropping some truth bombs. Um, boys, any other notes from the game before we move on to other stuff? Um. I didn't realise till afterwards that this was Portsmouth's first comeback win in, I think, two years or close to two years. So that says a lot. That was a team that were without their their leading goal scorer in, in John Marquise. Ellis Harrison is out as well. Um, I thought they were OK. Now, I, I got an email from a, from an angry Portsmouth fan on Saturday, not on Sunday, saying that my report was, was very biased and that uh, Portsmouth deserved to win the game and they were all over Ipswich. And I actually thought I was... All I said was I just didn't think Portsmouth were anything special. I thought they had Hawula up front, who was a willing runner. He, he charged down Thomas Holy's kicks at every opportunity, sprinting them down from 40, 50 yards away, which clearly was a tactic. But I didn't think they offered a great deal in attack. This is a team that had not scored for three games. I think the game before that was a penalty as well. So a bit like Ipswich, they don't possess a, a huge goal threat, certainly not at the moment. So to be able to concede twice against them and lose the game made made it all the more galling, really. Mm. Um. Boys, after the game, I tweeted something about town as a biscuit being a rich tea because they're a, they're a classic. Yet they disintegrate as soon as they're dunked into a bit of hot water. Um, an analogy which people seem to enjoy. So I wondered, what about players as biscuits, or indeed us, the four kings as biscuits? Obviously, Ross is a jaffa cake. I, I don't I don't know if that uh, qualifies biscuit. as a biscuit or is it a cake? Mm. I mean, mm, touchy. Um, but I was thinking someone like Andre Dizel would be one of those those fancy. Um, 
whirl wafer things that you get you know that look incredible viennese viennese but, whirls absolutely but uh, maybe a little bit brittle every now and then um, but look look fantastic and are capable of great things uh, and maybe norwood i thought chocolate digestive again does exactly what it says on the tin works hard you can always rely on a chocolate digestive uh, and it is occasionally brilliant um any, any other thoughts boys on the biscuit front players as biscuits uh what have we got Chambers, for example, what would Chambers be? Custard cream. What and what? How? You've just said a you bit. Know, all you've done there is just shouted out a biscuit. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what? No. What's, what? No, no, no. Just justify it. Yeah. Well, it's got two layers in it. You know, it's got the <laughs> cream inside. So it's got that's the leadership, and then the <laughs> cream equals leadership. Yeah. Cream equals leadership. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and the other layer is just yeah. He's just he's just a. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. where I'm going with this. Uh, could, could one suggest that a custard cream is perhaps past its best as a biscuit? And, there you uh, go. Other there biscuit, we go. Other biscuits. <laughs> past its best. I disagree. I really like custard creams. Oh, now you do. You're very much so, a traditionalist. <laughs> yeah, I like I like a custard cream. I would, I would put Luke as kind of a, a hob, a plain hobnob with no yeah. chocolate on the back. Um, a good solid biscuit. It's not as not as it's not as good as a chocolate hobnob. No, chocolate hobnobs are much better. They're peak. But yeah, Luke. But Luke, I would put Luke down as a good, solid, chocolateless hobnob, who doesn't get the respect he deserves, but yet also isn't top tier. Uh, no. Yeah, I'd probably put him at that plain hobnob, which Honest. is fine. Honest. Very honest. Yeah. It is what it is. A plain hobnob is what it is. It's it's standing there bare, mm. kind of just being just being itself. Um yeah. Are there any jammy dodges in the side? It's a bit like where, like if you went over to your nan's when you were younger and she'd bring out a little plate of biscuits or a little Tupperware of biscuits, and it she wouldn't necessarily have the best ones, but you the hobnob, if there was a hobnob there, you'd you'd take it fairly high up the list. You'd be thinking, mm. Wish there was something a bit better, but yeah, that that's fine. That'll do. Boys, do you remember right. the do you remember the Viscount biscuits that were oh, wrapped in the in the green green foil? Have we got a Viscount in the side? They did an orange version of those as well, didn't they? They did. They did. Um, if you are listening, this is this has four professional journalists comparing Ipswich Town players to biscuits. As you were, this is a sort of analysis that's that's made our name. Um, but the other from moving from biscuits onto a serious debate, Stewie. You weren't around last week, but it all got a bit a bit testy at one point last week when we, we talked about the chances of town making the playoffs. Um, your friend and mine, and indeed everyone's friend, your partner in crime, Andy Warren, insisted, very insistent, that they are oh, going to yeah. make they are going to make the playoffs. And Roscoe, contrary to his normal laid back persona, shouted him down, said, No, I disagree with that. Um, to be fair, Ross well, declared the season to be over about a month ago, didn't you? After, <laughs> yeah, after, yeah. after a game, Northampton nil nil. That was that was bad. Yeah, season so thought, se- season over. I thought now that your back to you was the adult in, in all of these conversations. Um, what what your thoughts are? Because clearly, Town's running is very kind on paper. Um, a few mm. of those a few of those sides are in good form, as we were discussing before we started recording. But if you had to if you had to be put on the spot now, our town going to make the playoffs? What, what, what would you say? Uh, if you really had to twist my arm, no. Wee. No, having looked at, if I really look at it sort of objectively and logically, and I've started to analyse the sort of the running compared to others, yes, it's on on paper, it's it's kind. There's a lot of the sort of bottom six, bottom eight teams to play, but there's a lot of games on the road, and I don't think you should sort of underestimate that. And put it this way, if you replicated their results against, we talked about them being sort of flat track bullies and we're almost taking it for granted that they they will beat the the bottom sides. I've actually looked, if they replicate their results against the the teams they've got to play from the the reverse fixtures and Wimbledon, they've got to play twice. So we'll we'll take their results against them from last season just as as an example. They would win five, draw three and lose three which I don't think would be enough to get them in the playoffs. And can I really see them 
massively improving on what they've already done against these teams. The current form and everything we've talked about with fitness and mental fragility and, and all of those sort of things, I just can't see a sort of a a real momentum run going. I think they'll do enough to win certain games along the way and, and ultimately maybe just finish just short, almost in a seventh or an eighth. And mm. if they do scrape into sixth, there's no way I could see them winning a two-legged game because of the, the reasons that we've discussed and the lack of goals as well. Mm. Hutchie, are you standing by your your comment, your statement from last week? Town are going to make the playoffs. Because I've got to say, I'm minded to agree with Stu and Roscoe. I, I can't see it. They're too they're too fragile. I don't know if I was saying they are going to make the playoffs. I was saying oh, they we'll absolutely. Go back. We'll go back. Okay, I was saying I was saying very passionately that they absolutely can make the playoffs, and I still think they can. Though that the points that Stu's just mentioned there would take Ipswich to 72, 75 is your, is your marker. For your for your playoffs, there that's that's one one extra win out of those, and and I do, I, on, I honestly think they can. Obviously, I've I've lost a game since since last since last week's bold claims, um, but no, I, I really do think they can. And but I I've obviously once you're in, it's a completely different story. Like like mm. like I said last week, even if they do get in, that it's not going to happen for them there, but. On the flip side of that, I think, like, again, we've talked about being sort of blinkered as to what Ipswich's deficiencies are. Nobody else is ripping this up. I think, for me, the top four looks out of reach now. You know, we go back to the Jimmy Walker tweet about if we can't finish top four, we may as well pack it all in. I think that's gone now, if I'm honest. Um, I think it's a, a sort of a, a whole number of teams fighting for fifth, sixth spot now. I think that's what the battle that Ipswich are in. Doncaster, I think, Fading since since Darren Moore's gone, Charlton doing okay. We've got Nigel Adkins in there now, but their, their fixtures are are looking quite difficult on paper. Portsmouth, as we've discussed, I thought they they were okay. Nothing more. To see what sort of impact Danny Cowley has. Gillingham, we know all about them. Maybe maybe they can sort of scrap scrap their way in. I don't know. Blackpool are absolutely flying below then. And then really, I, I would probably start to draw a line pretty soon underneath them. Maybe Oxford or or Accrington. Oxford, we've seen, are, are capable of a run. But probably they're all having the same exact same discussions that we are having about having certain deficiencies in the team and whether they can do it. Because nobody, we've talked about this being a very average division this year. So it is still certainly there for the taking for Ipswich. But, but I, I still think they might just just come up short. Rossi, you look like you wanted to say something. Did you put your hand up? Yes, like back in school and all that. I don't like to jump in. I feel do like you need, I will. Do you need a wee? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Can I have the um, toilet permission? Path, please? Permission. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's just about the running again. I know I'm jumping on the bandwagon always with this, but I'm even looking at the teams below us in the relegation zone. There's teams there like Swindon. Um, Northampton have got to play they're going to be fighting for their lives to stay in this division so them games are going to be tough um, you know I know we can beat them sort of sides but you know we didn't beat Swindon that was live on Sky earlier in the season um, so that's what I'm looking at more really is those sort of games that they're, they're winnable but they're going to be fighting for their lives to stay in League One so mm. yeah very intriguing um, I think that's not we probably don't look at that that often maybe in previous seasons we, we don't we don't care about them because they're, oh, they're going to go down whatever but that all oh, my doorbell's going. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave you to it while I answer my door. Okay. See you in a moment. Um, Hutchie, if if town don't make the playoffs and you think they will, how much of a, a failure is that given the squad they've got, the position they've been in? Clearly, Cook has a free pass. We're not suggesting anything other than Cook should get a lot more time uh, and clearly needs a lot more time uh, inheriting the squad that he's got. But that's got to be a failure, hasn't it? If Town don't get into the top six, two years in a row in League yeah. One and not making the top—that's it's a massive failure. And mm. and obviously we're not putting that we're not putting that on Paul Cook's shoulders at, at this stage. But for the whole football club, it's, a, it's two seasons in the third tier. It's a massive failure, of course it is. And, I, I, and you can't argue anything. I think I, that you'd struggle to find anybody internally that could argue differently on that. Mm. Um, the whole yeah if, if they don't make the top six even that the, the making the top six could be completely futile in that if you if you get knocked out in the semis as well but it's at least a kind of a marker of being in the 
in the fight, as Paul as Paul Lambert always used to always used to say. Um, but yeah, massive failure if they if they um, if they put two years in a row. Sorry, Andy. The, the bigger clubs that have dropped into to League One, and we know that some of them obviously took time to get back out. And I'd need to go double check back on this, but I seem to remember when we were looking when Ipswich first got relegated, we looked at the the, the narrative surrounding I don't know Sheffield United, Nottingham Forest, whoever else. The teams that kind of hung about in League One, they were making playoffs, you know, more often than not before they finally got back up. I don't think there's many that finished sort of out the playoffs a couple of times. Um, I'd, have, I'd have to double check on that. But um, yeah, to, for that to happen two years in a row, whatever we think about, whether, however much we've overestimated the quality of this squad, it's still, it's still got to be better than that. It's got mm. to be. Mm. Just one more note from the game. Uh, if you haven't already, and I'm sure you have, um, if you're listening to this, if you haven't already gone back and watched Stu and Andy's post-game verdict from Saturday, go back and watch it now on social media. Uh, but investigate what Hutchie's doing with his hands for the first part of the video. Um, it's that <laughs> you've got that you've got that situation. What was it? Well, exactly. Go back and watch it yourself, my friend. You 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 face the, the same conundrum that anyone who's ever had to talk on camera for a significant period of time faces. What do I do with my hands? And clearly at the start, you're trying to find a, a kind of convenient, cool position in which to put them. Um, but you, you you juggle quite a lot. Go back and watch it, my friend. It caught my eye because I face that same conundrum. Always, my friend, unless you're holding a microphone, go with the pockets. That's what I say. One hand in the pocket, one hand on the mic. Um, See, so I yeah. normally I normally do go with the pockets, to be fair. On this scenario, I was standing next to, I was standing on a, on a ledge kind of on a row next to a, I think I was next to a metal, like one of the metal kind of gates. Yeah. And that, that maybe distracted me because I yeah. there was something, there was something there for me. You alternated from sort of leaning and then yeah. kind of going like yeah. this or sort of doing this and then like this and like, yeah, you're all over the shop. Go back and watch it, my friends. Not just for that, obviously for the, uh, the white hot insight into the game as well. Right then boys, that's Portsmouth line drawn under town of lost. Um, things aren't going too well on the pitch. But in terms of this podcast, things are going pretty well. We've reached somehow show number 200, as I say. Don't look too closely at the stats because we probably have done a little bit more than 200. But anyway, today is 200. So, boys, I just want to have a rather self-indulgent aside um, where we congratulate ourselves and slap ourselves on the back for, for reaching this milestone. 19th November 2017, KOA 1 started with just two of the current Kings. I'm looking at you, Stu and Andy. Town had just drawn 2-2 two, 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 two at Hull, easy for me to say. Um, you opened with a discussion about La Beast, Hutchie, which still has not been consumed. Um, you actually started the whole KOA show promising you were going to tackle that one day. Still, to this day, you haven't. You've blamed COVID, which is particularly poor. Mentally, mentally weak, Hutchie, if you don't mind me saying. Um, but unbelievably, going back and listening to some of the phrases you were coming out with in, in that first show, Town's terrible record against a side in the top half of the table, not being able to finish sides off, being too fragile. These are recurrent themes, boys. Um, I also enjoyed, and this was this was a brief feature of the early Kings of Anglia shows, Football Room 101. Can you remember all the way back to the first show, what you put in Football Room 101? It was football warm-up jackets. Went into yeah, into room pres uh, yeah, presentation jackets to That's it. A to accompany a player from the dressing room to the side of the pitch, and then thrown on the floor for the kit man. Absolutely, um, I. Uh, it's fair to say, boys, you didn't really enjoy doing the pod to begin with, did you? You, you, you tended to in record it in the office on a Sunday, um, where you, you felt like you'd spent all weekend and most of the week talking about it switch town, and then you had to go and talk about them again, but more animatedly, on a podcast. Um, so we decided we need a charismatic, good-looking, incredibly talented host. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't find anyone, so uh, I, I stepped in. Um, May 25th, 2018 was my first KOA show. I made a guest appearance um, comparing Ipswich Town players to Winter Olympians on one of your early shows. But I, but I took over May 25th, 2018, and obviously... Uh, you know, history has been made ever since. Um, but if you listen to back to my first intro, it sounds like I'm there for a job interview. Embarrassingly low key from myself. Obviously, not something I could ever be accused of. Introduce myself as the sports editor of these things in Daily Times, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and then, and then a year later, the the final member of our team 
was added as we moved into our posh new studio at IO Radio. God knows when we'll ever be back there. Um, 13th of May, 2019, young Roscoe came along as producer Ross to begin with. Um, and we introduced his famously weak uh, immune system, which hadn't succumbed surprisingly to COVID. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was, when, that was when the team really started. And obviously things have changed a lot since then. Town have been relegated. We've had a lot of bad news to talk about most of the time. But um, it's, been, it's been good fun, hasn't it, boys? I just wondered um, what your favourite memories are. I've got some stats I want to share with you. But um, certainly for me, I look back at uh, Crisp episode which uh, we recorded i think that's still the only extra time show isn't it we said we we're going to do more but when we we dedicated more than half an hour talking about our favorite crisps and coming up with an ultimate koa crisp champion monster munch pickled onion if you're asking which uh, was actually pinned to the top of our, t- our twitter while P- paul hurst was being sacked so there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's that, show, there's that show that stands out which still uh, i get people saying it was great uh, and, and enjoying it um i also have to say obviously koa live one where i attempted to set a world record for the most swearing in a, in a number of minutes uh, while knocking back the red stripe beers and also um there was a there was a show uh sh- i think it was actually a show before that where mick mccarthy famously stormed into the koa courtroom um swore and left and that was also historic because that was the first strike that show so there you go. Uh, any any particular memories of you boys that you want to share? I've got some thoughts from the KOA Army as well, which I'll I'll drop in in a minute. You can't see it at the moment, but to my right, um, I've got a little shelf which has got about forty five strike trophies on it from uh, <laughs> from my uh, from my winning record, which is you know they're gathering a little bit of dust. I might need to give them a bit of a polish, but um, yeah, very 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 proud of winning such a prestigious title again and again um i think the crisp one's the best one we've ever done if i'm completely honest and i, and I don't know if that will ever be topped but maybe go and give that a listen if you haven't yeah it's it's around what was it october 2018 wasn't it when hurst was was on his on his last legs we recorded it because i think was there an international break or something so we didn't we didn't have a lot to talk about and we thought let's just do this for a laugh um you two were fueled entirely by slushies from the cinema um and uh yeah we, we spent half an hour or more talking about crisps so do go back and listen to that because it's still relevant i suppose we still have the same views on crisps there's been no crisps that have come along since have changed my mind um stewie have you got any uh any any favorite memories you want to want to share with your public i would chuck the first appearance of barry cotter into yeah <laughs> yeah um i think that was a, that was a landmark moment um you getting presented with your Aaron Drynan shirt? At yeah. AOA Live One. Now on the and wall. Yet more fine work from, from producer Ross. Um, yeah. They, whoa, they, whoa, they, whoa, they, whoa, they, whoa. They, whoa. I printed that shirt. I, I printed think, it. We still, think, we still think it might be the only Aaron Drynan shirt ever printed, don't we? At, yeah. At the shop, other than the one that he wears. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't, don't just leave, don't leave me out. Sorry, Andy. Thanks yeah. to your fine work as well. Thanks. Um, Thanks. You're welcome, think, everyone. Um, and also, I think we need to give a nod to the to the uh, the prequel to KOA, of course. That absolutely of, with uh, with my former colleagues, they, uh, Chris Brammer was. was you doing like, I, like you I was going to say Dave, no. Sorry, no. I hadn't forgotten anything. Dave Good. I was going to say Dave Gooderum, but I don't think Dave Dave did podcast. It was it was Chris Brammer and. Um, and Ed Crossway was presenting was. at one stage as well, wasn't he? So uh, I think it, it took us a while to kind of find our our brand, didn't it? I think you're right. When Andy and I were doing them, um, it sounds wrong to say, but to, to kind of drum up the the, uh, the energy for them at, at that stage in, in the week after we'd produced. Sadly, this isn't the only thing that we produce. This isn't our entire week as much as we'd love it to be. We're Absolutely. still producing a lot of extra content. So, um, but yeah, it's just it's just been good fun, isn't it? It has been good fun. And Hutchie, of course, going all the way back to when this was Sleeping Giants and you were working on the, the web desk for news, this podcast was your idea. You started it as the host of Sleeping Giants. It was a general sports podcast. Um, Yeah, so full yeah. credit to you, my friend. Insight, we're, as I always say. We were all huddled around one very cheap 
podcast microphone in an office where pictures were falling off the wall. <laughs> um, yeah, that was in the, the old office, wasn't it, on Lower Brook Street? Mm. I've still got that microphone. It's in the bottom of bottom of my wardrobe. It's a it's an antique, I would say. The, the very yeah. first, the very first microphone. Not we ever. Used to people but... coming in that had pre-booked the meeting room, and they would sort of walk in halfway through, and there was there was a low hum of the uh, the aircon of the aircon in the background <laughs> and stuff as well, wasn't there? Was, yeah. Wasn't Ross, I'll, I'll come on to you in a minute because um, a lot of the the thoughts we've had from the Cow Army, I asked again very self indulgently just for thoughts and memories, um, and it seems like that you are the the standout star of KOA. Just let me read a few of these. Harvey Davis, friend of the show, Sweet Welsh Prince, um, says a monumental moment for me was, of course, getting a selfie with Hutch. Uh, I think I was at Blue Monday Live, wasn't it? It um, was. It sent me on my way to becoming KOA friend of the show. We've had our disagreements about McDonald's breakfast, but I'm still honoured. Luke Penning, I've been listening as long as I can remember. Can't pin a da- date on it. Favourite moment, the various pronunciations of former town players from Ross and the multiple KOA Lives having attended. He was there at KOA Live 1. Um, Kevin Quinton says that the show explaining your call for Lambert to go was measured, informative, and interesting. Um, ben Diath, congrats to the whole team. Thank you for letting me contribute to the KOA spin offs. FPL Tractor, my highlights Ross's pronunciation of virtually anything. <laughs> the honest analysis of the end of the McCarthy era that showed up the national media's bad take, and the first time I heard the strike. Any behind the scenes stuff, it's really interesting to me. Daryl, friend of the show number one. Daryl Jones over in Australia, Australia, America, whoa. Jacksonville. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's because I'm looking at some stats I'm about to bring up. Sorry, Daryl, I know you're not in Australia. Um, he, he's been with us since Giants were sleeping, and he shouts out Ed Crossway and Chris Brams. Um, Chris Bennett, always a great listen, especially when Ross attempts to say some names. Um, <laughs> our, the trend our, here. Yeah, our, Dane, our, our Viking friend, Sindre, um, he says he's been listening since early 2019, Stu. So you'll like this. My best moment has to be the game show where the objective was to purposely pronounce names incorrectly. <laughs> now, this was yours, wasn't it? Was this not? I, I vaguely remember this is when I was away and you came up with a, a show, uh, an, an idea of, of purposely mispronouncing names, a.k.a. Yeah. the um, the guys who do it on the, uh, the public address before the game, which amazingly Ross struggled with. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought that I thought he would be absolutely right in his wheelhouse, but he, he just really struggled. He just pronounced them all properly. It was <laughs> it kind of fell a bit flat. <laughs> it's not written in front of me. I think if it's in front of me, then that's when I just butcher it. But when it's actually been told to me properly, I then go, I just follow your footsteps basically. And just said, Oh, you said it like that. You just so, repeat yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Who would, have seen, who would have seen that coming? Maybe we'll uh, try that again another day, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll write it down on a piece of paper and hold it up that's, to the That's the way to yeah. do it, yeah. yeah. We'll do yeah. It yeah. Now, now we're on this uh, newfangled video thing. Daniel Hill says, the Chris special was a favourite, as well as Ross, and this is, I have to say, this is one of my highlights, now I'm reading it, as well as Ross with Patrick Kiss Nobbo. Do you remember that? <laughs> 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 that was bad. And, and his tiebreaker question, asking what flavour cereal bar he had in front of him, which he then got wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a highlight for me. <laughs> oh, dear. Dear, oh, dear. Oh, Kev, dear. Kev, Kevin says, I have to admit, Mark being quizzed not very successfully on his first love UFC was amusing. That was in the summer tapes, the lockdown period, wasn't it, Hutchie? Where our, yeah, our, you... our, our Amsterdam correspondent, Peter McLeod, put together a mastermind for me and Hutchie. Hutchie's was The Office and mine was MMA slash UFC and I did very, very badly. Um, yeah, not my finest moment. T Seg's favourite moment for me was Hutchie declaring Queener overrated. Still one of the most controversial moments of KOA history. Um, Aaron Tester, was he two or three time live strike champ? I've, I've lost count. Yeah, but then, but then he absolutely, absolutely failed, didn't he? In another... Didn't he do another yeah. one with you, Ross? And was absolutely yeah, shock, yeah. absolutely shocking. He got one out of ten, didn't he? Yeah, he did, he did a yeah. Fleetwood. He Fleetwooded it. Um, he says highlight for me so far is the live show, closely followed by the singing of jingles, which always puts a smile on my face. Roscoe, as I say, you are coming up quite a lot in these favourite memories for your your comedy persona. Have you got any uh, any favourite parts of the show that you you recall? I think your your guys' reaction with Barry Cotter because that was. It's very hard for me to keep secrets. So when when I was able to play that, and then just your reaction, that was good. Um, the Germany pods, um, 
when the guys did it in Germany, I was washing up in the background. That was um, <laughs> maybe I should have washed up, but I knew we were we were rushing to actually like, leave the the place. So I was like, I need to wash up while you record. Um, and of course, there's some low lights. Um, you know, some pods that we've recorded or haven't been recorded, but they've been absolute gold. And then I realised, oh uh, yes, um, that happened quite recording. a lot didn't it? In, in the early days of the studio. <laughs> Yeah, we do about twenty minutes, and it was really flowing nicely. And then you, your face would go ashen, and you go, "Uh, I, oh, sorry, guys, we're not recording." <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah. And a few times I've had needed a wee during the, you know, in the studio where I've just gone, guys, I need a wee. Be back in a minute. And then I yeah. come back. And yeah. oh, there you go. You do, you do put your hand up. To be fair, and ask permission. So that's all good. Um, a few, I'll just take a few more. And then I want I want to share some stats with listeners just because I think they're interesting. Um, Jack McLean, friend of the show, number four. Jack's larder. Favorite memories include Stu's rap from a few weeks ago, the Little John rap. I vaguely remember I was doing the Fresh Prince of Bel Air rap at some point, boys, as well. Have I made that yeah. up? Yeah, no, we did uh, that. The the audio on it was horrific, though. Was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but so the rapping need, was golden. We need more rapping from Stu. The inside knowledge has been brilliant and how open you are with us is unmatched. Harry Butcher, friend of the show, number seven, man with the arrows. I've been listening for over two years and my favourite moment is being inducted as a friend of the show. Andy Warren gave a speech that sent goosebumps down me. There you go. Hutch, I, w- I will do I will do that sometimes. Do, do you know that. what a feature that kind of died died a death was when Andy started doing kind of fan fiction of Ipswich Town. Oh, yeah. he, would, he would come up with a little story about Paul Lambert going for for an Indian takeaway or something, and uh, I've got. I I, funny you should say that. I have got. I have got some something in the pipeline for that, but it's quite a big project. So, Is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it might be a serial kind of a almost like the Archers. Hey, we always need to add to this. We can't. We can't stand still, boys. Um, Nathan yeah. King, Highway Live um, attendee number one. Been listening to you guys since the very start. One of my favourite moments with our friends Mick Mix cameo in the courtroom. Um, which, yeah, as I say earlier, that was that was a good one. Um, I'll just take a couple more. Uh, Chris Miles, as a, as a now non-local town fan, I love the behind-the-curtain feel mixed with a bit of banter and good humour. You can tell you all get on well. Joke's on you, Chris. We actually hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> this is all an act. <laughs> um, and, and just finally, N- Nigel G, friend of the show number nine, says, bigger than Kings of Leon, listening for at least two years, best moments, becoming a friend of the show, Ross's pronunciation of Sergi Bolcher, another great one. I still think Patrick Kiss Nobo was better. Um, top behind the scenes insight, KOA Live, and addressing the big issues, e.g. Yorkshire's with Christmas dinner. Keep up the good work. Um, also input from Ross Evans, who again says the strike, Ross, the strike, and Ross constantly mispronouncing players' names. It's all been gold. Here's to 200 more. Um, and someone else actually saying, Hutchie's views, this is Mark Ewing, Hutchie's views on Queen, an important moment. So there you go. Maybe seminal seminal yeah so um there you go boys there's a few thoughts from the koa army a few favorite memories just stats wise the most listen thing we've ever done had nothing to do with any of us do you know what it was mix mick the audio of mick thumping mm. the, the desk Exa- on his way exa- out. exactly that mick um dropping the mic and exiting stays left after that that Excuse me, game. Can, I'd like to hear a bit, can we hear a bit more about that, please? <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 the single most listened bit of content we've ever done. None of us were involved in that, apart from Stu. Just, he was. just, uh, just, just following after him. Um, we've got fifty. You know, boys, we've got of our listeners, fifteen percent of them are women, and yet we never hear. We don't hear enough from our female listeners. So, if you are a female listener, we get some feedback every now and then. But please do get involved when we ask for mailbag and. Um, generally sending abuse to us get involved i uh, don't so just let it be mailbag. exactly that's, there's a whole there's the a problem. oh i see so if we change the female bag maybe that's, that's what we need point. let's do let's yeah. do a f- female bag yeah i said that... outlawed that term in 2021 <laughs> <laughs> it does sound a bit wrong doesn't it um obviously uk is our, is our biggest listening base but in terms of countries australia the second biggest koa listenership Followed by America, obviously big in America. Daryl's been telling all his mates, and we've got Scott Candidge out there as well, and our and our mate Lib. Uh, but fourth place, boys, India. Have, is there any Ipswich Town links in India? I, did, I wasn't aware of that. Michael Chopra. <laughs> can't, can't, can't just be chops. <laughs> it's all I've got for you. <laughs> and also in terms of cities, boys, um, obviously London, Ipswich, they're the top ones. Norwich are in fifth. 
there's a there's around four percent of our listeners come from Norwich. Some brave souls over in Norwich listening to the KOA podcast. Um, so there you go, boys. I said it. Do you think if we went to America now, it would be a bit like a bit like the Beatles in '64? Right? Very similar. Yeah, very similar. Maybe we should do a KOA live over there, Madison Square Garden in the toilet or something. <laughs> <laughs> we should go to um, Ipswich in Massachusetts. Yes, go to the other Ipswich and just see. There's, what a, there's an Ipswich in Australia as well, isn't there? Yeah, Maybe do that as well. This. I mean, I'm sure Archie haven't got a problem with paying for us to to go on tour. The money they will get back will be twice that. So there you go, boys. Um, any anything else to mention, boys? Before we 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 go over to the star of the show for, and I've asked him to produce a KOA 200 themed strike. Uh, I have no idea what he's done, so um, you're going to find out as we do, and I'm sure it's going to be fun. Uh, shall we go straight over to, to the strike, boys? What do you reckon? Let's yeah. do it. Take Let's it away, Ross, star of the show. Before before I get started, I also want to give credit to, to Hutchie as well because he made up the name, the jingle. He did the like he spoke in the jingle, so really, you should get the credit. I'm just here to yeah, no, no one gives no one gives the behind the scenes people the credit for, for the generation game, do they? That was Bruce Forsyth. So you're you're Bruce. You're Michael Barrymore. You're, <laughs> you're all of all of them, all the greats, all the greats. Yeah. Ross, before we get before we dig ourselves a massive hole, why don't you start the strike? <laughs> yeah, let's go, let's go. All right then, Gaffer, Hutchie, Stu, it's time for the strike special, and it is all based around all the characters that are brought: Sergi Bolcher, Boncho Gwenchev, Patrick Giznobo. <laughs> Aaron Dryden's getting chucked in for you, Heathy. Yes. Barry Cotter's getting chucked in. My boy Guion is in there as well. So um, let's go. So first question. Now, I'm making sure now as well, I'm more prepared that I do actually write down the scores because in the early days, I always went, who's winning? But now, well, you, didn't, you didn't bother writing down the answers in the early days, right? <laughs> yeah, it was just sort of on the fly, on the fly. Yeah. Can I just check, yeah. is the format the same? Uh, not really. The format sort of got mm. out the window the last few weeks. We had a Mars Kenlock special. Um, we've had a few specials recently, so the format is currently out the window, but it will come back, same format, so look forward to that later on. So um, first question is on good old Sergio Bolcher, um, or Sergio Boltaccia, which is his real name. I don't know why I said Sergio Bolcher. I don't know, just in the moment, I think, because um, I had it in front of me. Um, if Stu actually told me how to say it originally, I would probably would have said it properly. But um, did you know? So you didn't nail that on me. Why is it up to <laughs> me? <laughs> all your fault. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah. Mm. But um, he has a, he has a he has a son called Sergi Bolcher Junior. So he? and he was also a footballer. Does he? Um, yeah. Wow. Sergi cool. Bolcher Junior. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, he was is also that, a footballer. Yeah. Is that the question? Uh, did yeah, you that's know? Thing. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> point to me. <laughs> but no, but no, he was um he yeah he was a footballer, but we, um he played. He started his career at which Scottish club? Is that Motherwell, St Mirren, or Livingston? Who's this? His son or or Sergi? Sergi Bolcher <laughs> Junior. His, his son. Where did he start his career? What were the yeah. options? Livingston, Motherwell, or St Mirren? Hmm. I'm going to say Livingston. I'm going to say Motherwell. I wanted to say Motherwell as well. Shall I say well, the can. other one just to make it interesting? Do St. It. Mirren. It is St. Mirren. Yeah. Oh. Knew that. In the early <laughs> days of the strike as well, I used to always sort of, you know, sort of give away the answer or sort of go, yeah, you got it right. And then not, none of you guys have answered it. So I think that's long gone now. I use my poker face. Um, I think I think everyone can perfectly. agree. Ross. I think everyone can agree that you're incredibly polished now. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think um, next up is good old bunch of Gwentjev. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> good old using it. Bunch yeah, of you know. yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know where good old good, good, good old has come from. Yeah, is it like getting knighted? If like be, becoming a sir, if you become a good old in Ross's book, then you've you've made it. Ross yeah. with a sword just crossing the shoulders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> arise, 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 good old Sergi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> an, M an MBE is my friend. And then, yeah, good old is Sir. 
<laughs> so, um, but yeah, Boncho is, is a sir to me. So, yes, um, he had two spells at which non-league club in England? Was it Hendon, St Ives Town or Royston Town? I'm going to say Royston because the way you said it. <laughs> Royston. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Hen- Hendon Town. Which leaves me with St Ives. It worked for you last time. I'm just double check. I don't know if they're called Hendon Town. Okay. Just called okay, Hendon I'll, FC. I'll go Hendon. I'll go Hendon FC then. It is Hendon. <laughs> <laughs> well, is Hendon's the answer, or Hendon is what they're called? <laughs> Hendon's the answer, but right. it, um, they are just called Hendon. Just wanted okay. to. Do I go. still get a point? Yes. Edutainment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now it is the the boy, Patrick Kisnobo. He is back, and he's a manager now. If you didn't know about that, um, a lonely back in know. the day. Yeah, he's currently managing in Australia. Um, so, which Australian club is he managing? Is it Perth Glory, Wellington Phoenix, or Melbourne City? <laughs> City. City. I did that on purpose. That one. I don't think it's Perth Glory. Isn't that where um, Falami is Perth? Have I made that up? Um, I reckon it's Wellington Phoenix. I reckon it's Wellington Phoenix as well. Well, what was the last one, Ross? <laughs> Melbourne City. City. <laughs> um, is that where Falami's gone? I thought he was at Perth. Have I made that? Have I got nah, that wrong? Falami's down. He's down at Vic- Melbourne Victory. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go with uh, Melbourne City then. <laughs> and, and it is Melbourne City. Ah. Yeah. So Stu is currently 2 1 in front. He fee currently with zero points, but he's got a chance here with Aaron Dryden question coming up. Hey, Drizzy. Now, let's see if he knows his middle name. What is his middle name? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the obvious it, question. Yeah. Is it John, just like me and Hutchies? <clears throat> is it Jack my, or is it Jimmy? My middle name's David. But... Oh, yeah, mine's David as well, actually. <laughs> 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 my, my, dad's called, my dad's middle name is John. Oh, dearie me. Oh, just, dearie just, me. Just, for, just for the record, just so the listeners, might, they might have missed that, you just got your own middle name wrong. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, jeez. Amazing. Anyway, John, Jack or Jimmy. <laughs> John, John, Jack, or Jimmy? Yeah. <laughs> I think this is this is this. If you can we can we go through the bit where you asked me about my favourite moments again? <laughs> <laughs> this one, oh, the one where middle Ross... name's John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. Are you sure? Def- yeah. 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 Oh dear. Oh, dear. Passport. Oh, Ross. <laughs> Ross has just forgotten his own name. Uh, I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm going to say Jack because it's a good Irish name. I'll have to go with John. <laughs> I'll, I'll go Jimmy then. It is John. I think that's uh, what I was thinking. That that is that's the answer. Um, <laughs> you confused yourself with Aaron Drynan there for a second. Yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah, yeah. but Aaron John Drynan. Yeah, there we go. A little fun fact Ross, for you. Ross David Halls. Yeah. Yeah. But it's because my my dad's middle name is John. That's probably as well. I was thinking of. But... It's no, it's mate. It's not an excuse. <laughs> Just move on. No, no move on. Uh, my boy. No, it's Barry. Barry up next. Uh, Barry Cotter. <laughs> um, he hasn't played in the league for town. Of course, he's made them cup appearances, but he hasn't played in the league for town since coming on as a late sub in the four 0 defeat at Reading in 2018. But who did he replace? Interesting fact to know. Mustafa <laughs> Cariel. <laughs> Mr. Well, it isn't an interesting fact to know. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's sort of. If he if he gets released in the summer, we can sort of find out. You know, um, Ben Falami or Tristan Nydam. Falami, uh, uh, carry on. I would say carry on because I don't think you'd put that in if it wasn't the right answer because of your difficulty with saying it. Oh, Stu <laughs> is having an absolute blinder here. It's four for Stu. It's oh, so this is, he's absolutely this, nailing it. This isn't right. Hutchie, Hutchie wins every strike. 
Only as good as your last quiz. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is the real quiz as well. Two hundred. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like a proper two hundred shaped trophy as well that you'll get for this. But it's not over yet, though, is it, Ross? No, two more questions or one more question. Then we've got a tiebreaker. Um, mm. Boy Guion, he yes. scored on his debut. Um, he hasn't scored for a while, but wait for it. He's, he's got a great end of the season. He's going to score hat tricks and braces and great records for town. Um, but yeah, he scored in his debut against Blackburn in 2018. But who set him up for the goal? Was it Freddie Sears, Jonas Knudsen, or good old Coley Scuse? It was Freddie Sears, wasn't it? That was, that was the first game of Paul Hurst era, was it not? Freddie Sears cross, header. We all thought town are going up. Didn't quite turn out like that. Potentially, yeah. Just got to wait for the other answers. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was Freddie Freddie Sears, not good old Coley Skews. Sadly, go Freddie Sears. I'm going to be really fair here. I'm not sure if I'd have known the answer to that, so I'll I'll just let this one slide. Don't give me a point because I don't think that would have been my answer. Okay, yeah, it is Freddie Sears. Yeah. Sportsmanship that is. That's Paolo Di Canio catching the ball. The <laughs> you, also, you also know you can't be caught though, Stu. To be fair, it's now four two. So, are you going to do the um? Are you going to do the the gentlemanly thing and just put it all on the line for the final tiebreaker question? Mm, I don't know if I'll be that gentlemanly. <laughs> <clears throat> Come on, Ross. What is the tiebreaker? Just for do, fun. Do you, want, do you want to find? Okay, it is on KVY. Thanks for his return. I thought I'd do a question on him now. How much do you know about his early days playing for a non-league club? So he left Spurs and he spent time at this non-league club. Which was it? Banbury United, Hitchin Town or Biggleswey Town? Banbury United. Um, Biggleswey. I'm going to say <laughs> Biggleswey. <laughs> I think it's Banbury. I think it's... I think it's Hitchin. And Stu has done it again. It is oh, Banbury United. Absolutely. There we go. Destruction from Stu. Strike Thank number 200. We'll always remember it for Ross forgetting his own middle name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Dad. The John of the <laughs> <laughs> What's your middle name, Mark? Uh, Pierre. I don't believe no, you. Not. No, it's Peter. Yeah, yeah. It's Peter. Oh. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Peter. It's bog standard, solid. To be fair, Honest. John J- John and David are all are all pretty standard, solid middle yeah. names, aren't they? Yeah. Have you um did you give your, your daughter's middle names? Is middle name something that's a, a thing that's going out of fashion these days, or have they got like four middle names? Just one. Just, just one. Just the one. Fair enough. Ross, do you want to throw it to Barry? Yeah, good old Baza. Take it away, my friend. The last time you ever appeared on a town thing. So go. Good old BC Baker. Are you, have, you, <laughs> like... have you just sacked him? Is that is that what just yeah. happened? Well, I don't think he's going to get a contract, is he? So well, we're no. still going to we're still going to use him, though, aren't we? To outro the strike, he needs to do something. <sighs> he needs it. He needs this gig. <laughs> He needs the work. It pays well. Yeah, he doesn't look like Neymar anymore, does he? Because when he first signed, he looked like Neymar, didn't he? Remember that thing going on? Mm. But, yeah. It's not really panned out like Neymar, has it? All in all. <sighs> no. Right then, boys. There we go then. So that's the strike over. Another memorable strike. Um, and that is the end of the show. Unless you want to say anything else. You got any other business, boys, to mention before we uh, before I take our leave? We'll be back later this week to talk about the trip to Wigan and also potentially do the big contracts chat. But have you got anything else you want to mention, boys? Just thanks for listening to our nonsense. It's um, it's much appreciated. It'd be it'd be rubbish if nobody listened. So, uh, so thank you. I agree with that sentiment, Stewie. Yeah, th- thanks and that whatever. Um, I need to call <laughs> you out on something, actually, Mark. Me? Yeah, I need to call you out on something. There, there was a time where we used to do a lot of TV reviews and you'll remember that I came up very early in the line of duty process, maybe as early as season one or two, that I, mm. I, I said Kate could be H. I feel like you, you've kind of stolen that from me. You're now owning it as your own theory on social media. Oh, was that you? Because when I, I tweeted that last night, my wife claimed it was her theory as well. So clearly I've, yeah, I've well, stole, she I've stole, stole it. from me. Well, let's go back <laughs> to the tape. <laughs> 
Okay, so I just wanted that on the record. So and, you still uh, you yeah. still reckon you still reckon it could be her? Uh, yeah. Got to say, I'm boys. Less sure than when I first said it, but at least at least attribute it to its source. All right. Okay. Well, Stuart, it's, if if it is if it is um, Kate, then uh, then it was my idea. If it's not, it was Stu's idea. <laughs> um, but boys, on a TV review point, now you've brought up Line of Duty. I thought the first uh, first episode last night was pretty dull, didn't you? Considering the, the absolute drama we've had in the other first episode, Sandy Newton waking up just as she's about to be butchered, um, John Corbett being unveiled as a as a police informant. It was fairly tame last night, would you say? It was okay, wasn't it? Might be mm. a slow burner. I do have fears that this was kind of filmed in the middle of a, a pandemic and may may have been a little little rushed. Mm. But obviously, we've done the story now on the Marcus Evans link to, to Line of yeah. Duty. And the, the, the first three or four seasons were the best. And then Marcus sold all productions. Be go. careful what you wish for. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we should probably take our leave. Thank you for listening, like Hutchie said. Thank you for listening today, and also thank you for listening uh, throughout the the long tenure of KOA. Um, here's to another 200 shows. God knows where we'll be when that is. Hopefully in the Premier League under Super Paul Cook. Um, follow us across all our social medias, Kings of Anglia on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Go back and watch the video of Hutchie being uncomfortable with his hands. Let me know what you think he was doing. Uh, and also... Join us again later this week when we'll hopefully look ahead to Wigan and, and break down the contract situation, if indeed that is the right time to do it. Thank you all, friends. I say friends every week, and that's how I see you all. And we'll speak to you again. Don't shake your heads, Stuart. <laughs> I'll speak, we'll speak to you again later this week, please. <laughs>